Welcome to Growing Golf, presented by Syngenta. Today we're talking to Karen Proctor, Sales Director of Textron Specialized Vehicles in Asia. Karen shares her story from growing up in Saudi Arabia to becoming a trailblazer and vocal advocate for women leaders in golf. She says, Women can't be what they can't see. Now based in Singapore, Karen has become a powerful voice for change in the golf industry. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Karen Proctor, welcome to Growing Golf. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, let's go right back to the beginning. Okay. Tell us about where you grew up. Well, goodness me, that's a long time ago now. So I was um, born in the Bahamas and I was brought up in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we moved to England when I was 10. So I've had a bit of a different um, upbringing. So where's home then? I'm a big believer that home is where you make it. It's not necessarily a set place. So obviously I have my, my mom is in the UK and my, my brother and sister. So that's in one way home, but to me, home is Singapore. That's what I've made. And, that, and that's where, you, where you're living now. Uh, but I guess that's given you from an early, from an early uh, stage, you know, very much an international experience and an outlook. It has um, been brought up in Saudi Arabia. I went to a multinational school. I was brought up with children from all around the world. And it really um, allowed me to experience and really appreciate different cultures from a very young age. And something when I, the job offer came up in, in Singapore, I, I took without hesitation because obviously I wanted to get back to that. So what were you interested in as a, as a young person? What were you interested in? Were you interested in sport, for example? I was not. I was the least sporty person you can imagine. I would have done anything to get out of a sports day. Uh, I did gymnastics um, when I was in Saudi Arabia for a very, uh, very uh, slim amount of time. And I think that was basically handstands. I think that's as far as it got. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, really just reading. Um, I enjoyed music. But that was, that was pretty much it. Interesting, I guess, that probably at your time in Saudi Arabia, that probably golf wasn't, wasn't kind of very visible. Yeah. And now it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something else. It is. Uh, I really did not know anything about golf. In fact, if I told you some of the questions I asked when I first moved into golf, I'd be highly embarrassed by some of those questions that I'd asked. I, I, I didn't even know what a, a green or a tee was when I started working in golf. So it never come across my, my path before never something that featured in our family. Yeah, and as you say, Saudi Arabia didn't have a lot of golf courses. <laughs> so did you have a sense then as a, as a young person, um, you know, what you might end up doing? Did you have a, an idea of a, a, a career? I did. I wanted to be a fighter pilot when I was younger. And I realized that I didn't have 20-20 vision. I didn't quite have the IQ either. So that, that quickly went out the window. But I went to see a career advisor when I was probably about 14. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I like talking to people. And she said, well, okay, well, hotels would be a good option. So I was like, okay, I'll work in hotels. I said, how much can you earn? And she said, you can earn six figures. I can tell you I never earned six figures in hotels. And I was like, well, that'll do. And that was the beginning of my career path in, in hospitality. So when did that start? When, when and where was your first job? I started, so I left school at 16. And my, 16? 16, yeah. I wasn't a huge fan of school. Uh, I preferred to learn on the job rather than sit in the classroom. I just got very bored very easily. I've got um, very, very little patience to sit in a classroom and be taught for an hour and a half at a time. You know, patience. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody that knows me, I've got very little patience. So it, it just wasn't my learning style, you know, but put me in a, put a task in front of me that I can get my hands on and I can... I can really work at and I will, I'll do absolutely everything I can to achieve it. So yeah, probably not academic in the sense of sat in a classroom. So where was this first job in, in hotels? Oh my goodness, that was a long time ago. I was a telephonist um, in a five-star hotel in Chester. And I remember it was either the first day or the second day, the manager took me to one side and she said, Karen, you can't say okie dokie on a switchboard on a five-star <laughs> hotel. And I was like, Thank you very much. And that was my first ever lesson uh, in hospitality, but it was the start of a, a great career. I, I moved every year into a new position, just moved up from but there. But it sounds like you were, you were confident, you know, and as you said, a people person. So just to have that kind of conversational tone with people yes. <laughs> being on the telephone, you weren't, you weren't phased, you were kind of confident in, from, from day one, would you say? I wouldn't say I was confident. I, I've always had a... Um, 
a, a bit of a mantra, you know, you fake it till you make it. So, you know, as long as you um, are confident in how you, you portray yourself, I think a lot of that can can help, um, even if you're if you, even if you're not really. <laughs> Well, I suppose that, yeah, there's an element of kind of putting on a front and, yeah. you know, and, you know, sometimes you need that with people. And it's a bit like walking into a room when you're networking, isn't it? it is. You know, it can be really intimidating. But actually, if you make the effort and put a smile on and go up to people, people often respond positively. You do. You have to push yourself into different situations, I think, to, to really find your limits. And like a good example, like you said, putting yourself in a room full of people you don't know and just making that step to go and talk to that first person, you know, it is game changing, really. I had a, an experience at the GCSAA conference last year at the Syngenta's International Reception. One of the Ohio State University students came up to me, a young lady, and uh, she just came, came and said, can I talk to you? I yeah. said, yes, of course, yeah, that's right. She said, how do I network? I've been told I need to network. <laughs> I said, well, you're doing it now. You know, we're having a conversation. And we had this wonderful conversation. And then she ended up as a guest on this podcast. Yeah. And wonderful. she is the most amazing character, um, Mahali Nemjuda. And, and we had a, a, a most, she's got the most incredible story. So we were able to tell that. But that was a wonderful thing. And she's now gone on to do other things. But it's amazing, isn't it? What yeah. can happen from one simple conversation or connection yeah. that can move on to other things? Well, it's one of the reasons I started working for Jacobson because I was working um, as a director of golf and I went um, to the GCSAA show uh, with, with Carden Park that I was working for at the time. And I met Jacobson and I thought, I'd like, I'd like a job with these guys. So the next year I went out, I just, I just did that. I walked up to the sales director at the time and I said, I'd love to work for you. Well, you know, how do, how do I make that happen? There we go. So just rewind a little bit again. So tell us about the experiences in hotels and hospitality and then the moment that you, you, you joined golf. So I was working, um, as I said, started as a telephonist, worked my way up. And then I was working as a conference office manager. It was my first management position. And it was, I fell flat on my face as a manager in the first time around. I think. Why? What happened? Oh, I, in my naivety, assumed that everybody just wanted to be managed like me, you know, and I'm quite a direct person. I mentioned I'm impatient. So obviously that clearly didn't work for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that didn't go down, uh, didn't go down very well. But uh, I, it was one of the biggest learning curves I've ever had. I think failure is one of the ways you learn. And I was in that position and I got a call from a GM I used to work for. And he said, uh, do you want to head up my golf sales team? And I laughed at him at first because I said, I, you know, I know nothing about golf. You know, what are you expecting me to do? And he was looking for a skill set rather than a knowledge of product knowledge. He was very adamant that I could learn the knowledge of golf but he wanted the skill set that I had. So I said, within two seconds, yeah, I'll, I'll take it, you know, let, let me. And what was the skill set? What particularly about you and the way you did things, you know, kind of fulfilled what he needed? Yeah, so he wanted somebody who could really relate to people um, in a sales capacity. He wanted somebody who had a sales mindset. So that's what he originally was after. Um, obviously, I'd learned a few things about managing people in my first role, so I got slightly better at that. Not great. Um, that didn't, I don't think, improve a huge amount until I got to Textron. So, yeah, it, it was really the, skits, the sales element and the people element that he was, he was after. So this was a big, big move, big change to come into the golf industry. Yeah. What was it like? Um, what were the early learnings? I was, I was excited about it. I didn't necessarily see it as... Coming into to golf, or I, I saw it as just another challenge. You know, it was something I didn't know a lot about, so I could really forge ahead and, and find something, um, find out about another industry. But it didn't phase you that you didn't know about golf. Not at all. No, I, I've never been afraid to ask a silly question, and I asked many of those, as I as I mentioned earlier. So that that didn't phase me. And did you also have the support of the person who'd hired you to say, "Don't worry about that." Um, I, you I, can learn the knowledge. I did, yeah. He, he was very adamant about that. You know, he wanted somebody who could strategize as well, you know, as well as the sales and the people person. So that's I, I knew I had the basic skill sets that he was after, and the knowledge could come after. But I had a really good support mech um, network with him, and also the superintendent that was there. You know, both of them were very helpful when I when I asked all those silly questions. Were you aware at that point uh, about the 
uh, kind of gender balance or lack of <laughs> in golf? Was it evident I to you? I was not, no, not until probably more so when I became a director of golf. And uh, the, the place I worked was um, one of 12 resorts. And I went to my first meeting with all the other directors of golf and I was the only woman, but it never really dawned on me. Actually, I've never seen myself as being any different. I just saw myself as another person in there. I was doing a job and I had the same skill sets as them. Um, so I never really saw it as me being the only female. It was evident sometimes, but yeah, not always. And equally, were you treated equally and as no different? I was. I, I did feel um, potentially that I had to prove myself more, that I had to be better um, than, than my male colleagues. I don't know if that was just me, but I, I did feel that I had to earn my place. Um, and that wasn't anything to do with any of the colleagues I had. They were all fantastic. I think that was probably just something in me. So you're director of golf at yes. Carden Park. What was that like? What were the learnings you took from that role? Okay. Um, well, it was a great facility. It's a huge facility. So it's got two 18-hole champion golf courses. Um, it's got a spa treatment, uh, rooms, 13-bay uh, driving range. So really, the, the magnitude of it to start with, you know, I'd gone from really not knowing anything about golf and sat on a golf sales team, a small golf sales team for a few years, to then managing this, this resort, uh, I guess. And I think the, the biggest challenge was the number of people that reported into me, you know, I, I'd had no formal leadership training. What sort of number were we, are we talking about? So overall 70, 70 people um, with about, I think it was about six, seven direct reports. So it was a big team of people that we had because I managed the spa as well um, at one point. But it became very evident to me the different personalities that you deal with. Um, and that's really where my desire for, for leadership training was born because I realized, you know, if you have that basic training to start with, that transition is much easier, which is why I'm such a big fan of the, the Jacobson FTMI program that we do. Because, you know, had I had something like that, I think it would have been a much easier transition. So tell us about that, that initiative, that program, and indeed your move into, into Textron. Okay. Well, uh, the, the FTMI program that we do, the Future Turf Managers Initiative, um, was born out of the fact that there was, in the golf industry, especially for green keepers, there's so much agronomical training, but there isn't necessarily any leadership training. And what we really wanted to do is take those um, professionals that really had potential to go far and give them the setup to really take that next step and be successful and give them the skills that they needed. So we trained them um, over a few days with things like presentation skills, how to budget, how to interview people, how to recognize different personalities. And all of that really gives them a, a basic understanding to then take that next step and make it a little bit easier when you take that next step into leadership. Did this program exist before you arrived at Textron or is this something that, that you kind of facilitated? So the, it started when I um, first started at Textron and the idea came about by a lady called Gina Putnam. Uh, and she sat down and she did the white paper on it because she was very passionate about the same thing. And yeah, so she, uh, she instigated it, um, but I've been there obviously all the way through to see it from when it started to what it is now. And it's been wonderful to see that, that program grow. I wonder if this is a, an example of diversity of thought as well. Yeah. Different people coming into a, you know, an industry, coming with different ideas that may not have that golf knowledge or yeah. coming in different experience, hospitality or business, wherever. It's those ideas that then can address challenges and opportunities within an industry. Absolutely. And I'm a huge advocate for not necessarily just looking within the industry for talent, but looking outside of the industry. Because to your point, you know, we can bring in different skill sets and different ideas by looking further afield. Uh, there was a report in 2018 from McKinsey, uh, which looked at gender diversity and actually identified it, identified it as an advantage with the top 25th percentile of uh, diverse companies proving that they could be more profitable. So they're 21% more likely to experience above average profits. Yeah. So there's clear empirical evidence there that is. a more diverse workforce can lead to more profitable business. Yeah, McKinsey did a great report. I, I've read that report and one of the, I use it in some of my talks that I do. And one of the other um, elements that they mention is, 
it actually helps increase um, retention rates. And when we know that sometimes, especially greenkeeping, is such a difficult industry to get talent into, why? Who would not want to increase retention rates? So you know that that the, there's a multitude of benefits to actually having a more diverse workforce. So how is the Future Turf Managers Initiative going? What what what's it delivering? Well, we've had um, we we've got statistics that show that people who go on the course, a percentage of those do go on to be superintendents. So that's that's really positive. Uh, so it's really it's about giving back as well. I think. So I guess on the one hand, there's there's an opportunity um, to, to to get more women into the industry, but what about leadership as well? Yeah, and no, that's probably where my my passion lies. Um, you know, I think there's representation is key here, and I did a presentation in June in Australia where only 1.4 percent of qualified turf workers are female. And one of the ladies came up to me afterwards and she said, I can't be what I can't see. And I thought that was just said it all. And that was really spurred me on even more to think, I, I, even though it's out of my comfort zone, um, I've got to stand up and I've, I've got to represent here. Because if, you, if we don't have women representing in the industry, how can people be what they can't see? So... And and you put yourself forward in 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 that in, in that regard. Uh, yes, yeah, very much so. And I and I think you know there's a lot of women that do. You know, and I've got a lot of respect for any lady who stands up in this industry and you know talks about diversity. And it's not just about gender diversity. You know, it's about all diversity. You know, I think we could do with lots of different diversities in the golf industry, not just necessarily more women, because it's about balance. Exactly. And I think I've seen you quoted as saying it's going to take 150 years at this rate to, to get to. It was. And I can't remember if it was McKinsey or Deloitte report that I read that stated that. And I thought, that's terrible. <laughs> we need to do something about that. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different actions we can take to help move that needle. But it, it's going to take all of us. And it's, it's a multifaceted approach. You know, we're not going to change it. We're just one action. What about um, any young turf professional, female, or from any uh, you know kind of background, looking at this, thinking, "Well, that's fine for Karen. She's got plenty of confidence." Um, tell me about confidence, because that's a, a, a big thing, and you, I think you speak about that as well. As a female working in a male-dominated industry, and and standing up and trying to be that representation, one of the things I'm incredibly cognizant of is, you know, not to offend, and. I work with a, a coach, a presentation coach, because I was so concerned about standing up in front of primarily, the last one I did was 350 people, probably 98% of them were men, and talking to them about employing more females. You know, And I know from talking to people that they want to do it, but I didn't want to be seen as that woman that's standing up there saying, you have to do this. You know, So it's really important that we back it with facts. You know, you were talking about the McKinsey report before I've related to some of the Deloitte information I've, I've heard. So, you know, we've got to talk about facts and we've got to talk about how to change practical um, actions that we can take. But yeah, it, it's, it's nerve wracking standing up there and, you know, because you, you don't want to be hated. <laughs> you don't want to be... Um, seen as being you know a woman that's trying to force change but we, we have to as an industry we're all stakeholders and we all have to own our parts and I feel like I have to do that. And we can all benefit from that as well businesses can benefit and teams can benefit as well diverse teams are happier teams. They are you know we talked earlier about the fact that they're more profitable you know the, the better retention rates they're just two there's a plethora of um, benefits that come from a balanced team. So yeah, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for it. And I'll, I'll keep pushing and I'll keep trying to put that message the right way so as to not to offend anybody. But you know, if we want it to change, we, we've got to do something about it. But it also goes back to something that you said earlier about being a people person. Yes. You know, and the golf is a people-driven industry, it whether is. it's people working in teams within the industry or the customers. Yeah. And sometimes we forget some of that, and even within clubs themselves. Yeah. 
So people are important and people skills and, and young people learning those soft skills coming into, um, coming into work and coming into the industry is also an important thing. It is, and this is why I'm a huge advocate for looking outside of the industry as well. I met a lady in Malaysia who was heading up a, um, a golf resort and she had never worked in golf before, you know, but she had worked in hospitality. So she had the people skills, she had the organizational skills. Um, she knew how to drive revenue. She had everything that they needed. She just didn't have the, the knowledge of golf. So she learned the knowledge of golf and she's a hugely successful lady um, working in golf in Asia. I think confidence, you can build your confidence by building your knowledge, um, building experience, pushing yourself into um, activities or situations that you're maybe not as comfortable with. So, you know, I don't think, well, it certainly doesn't come naturally to me anyway. So if there is uh, young ladies out there who are looking to build their confidence, I'd just say push yourself into those situations that you don't think you can do because you would be amazed at what you can achieve when, when you put your mind to it. What about mentoring? Have you had a mentor? I have. I've got a phenomenal mentor. Um, I was managed by a lady called Heidi about five years ago now. And she, when she moved on in text to another um, division in Textron, the first thing I asked her was, would you be my mentor? Because obviously as my manager, it wasn't necessarily applicable, um, appropriate. But as, um, as when she was working in another division and she said yes, and I thought this is, this is a game changer for me. And I just wish I'd have had somebody like her when I was younger, <clears throat> because I think it would have made my career would have given me confidence much earlier on in my career. And I'm a huge fan of giving back for that reason. You know, we've got to help people who want to, want to progress. So, we, you know, it's, we, we're familiar with the term mentoring. There's probably only, actually only a small number of people who really, um, you know, experience mentoring perhaps in the golf yes. industry. Tell me what it is okay. and really how it benefits you. Yeah. I would say, and I actually Googled this before I started working with Heidi as a, as a mentee, because the Heidi, um, I wanted to make sure I made the most of her time because she's a very busy lady. And it was about going prepared, right? As a mentee, I needed to go prepared. Did I have any challenges? What did I need to learn? What situations did I want to understand more about? And as a mentor, it's not really necessarily about telling somebody what to do. It's really about talking them through different options and letting them come to their own solutions that are right for them, but obviously being there for them to be a sounding board and obviously offer advice if they, if they need it. But it's probably less about the talking and more about the listening, I would say. And what, what did you get out of it? And perhaps what did your mentor get out of it as well? Because it's a two-way thing, isn't it? It is, absolutely. I think um, I certainly learned from her experience. Um, she'd been through some of the same challenges that we talk about. And obviously I, I learned from how she'd handled different situations. And I think for her, um, a sense of giving back. You know, she'd, she'd clearly had mentors in the past, but it's not just necessarily about having one mentor, I don't think, you know, uh, she's incredibly good at the mentor for my leadership skills, for progression in my career. But I've also got, um, I've had a mentor with regards to financial acumen. You know, I think depending on what you need at the time depends on what that mentor looks like. And it doesn't necessarily need to be the same mentor throughout your whole career. So you moved to Singapore. Yes. Took on a big role. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, that was a, another example of putting yourself out of your comfort zone because I really didn't know anything about um, sales in Asia at, at the time. So I, I decided to take on a new challenge after being interviewed for the role. I got it, which was exciting. And I, th I think the biggest challenge when I first moved out there is learning the different cultures, uh, the way different cultures do business. Asia is not one place, is it? It is not, no. And I think sometimes, you know, we're, we're at risk in, in the Western world of thinking of Asia as one, and it's really not, you know, and there's some fantastic, a lot of fantastic different cultures in Asia. So being very cognizant and aware of those and how to conduct business, I don't speak any of the languages. So obviously that, that was a slight challenge. But it was um, it, it was a great experience. Well, it is a great experience. So, what's it like going into those situations and in perhaps countries like Japan? Yeah, Korea. Um, 
What's it like? You know, tell us, give us an insight into into doing business there. Two of my favorite places, such respectful cultures um, when you do business in, in Japan and Korea. And um, Japan's one of our biggest markets. So that's that's always great to go there and see them. Um, it's it, But when we talk about gender, you know, Japan and Korea are one, the, two of the places that have very few women as CEOs, as examples. Um, but I've always been treated with the most utmost respect. So I, I thoroughly enjoy doing business there. And how can you, in going back to leadership and encouraging uh, more women to come into the golf industry and also more female leaders, what are you doing? What can you do within your, within your role to encourage that? I think going back to the representation, really being there and putting yourself out there to show that other women can come through. I did uh, work with the Asian Golf Industry Federation when I was the secretary. Uh, we did panel discussions. Um, and you were the first female in that role. I was, yeah. So uh, I recently did a panel discussion with a lady in Vietnam who had come up the ranks as a caddy and then taken on she different roles. And she now runs a golf club in Vietnam. So listening to stories like that and really putting those ladies in, in the forefront of people's minds and showing local uh, women that this is this is the route to you know to success in golf when you can make it it's back to that see it to be it it is yeah you can't see what you can't be yeah. you can't be what you can't say sorry <laughs> <laughs> um but what next you know you've you've got this uh, you know drive to see more women come into the industry more women leaders and maybe not just the golf industry as well what what are you looking to achieve yeah so i'm currently looking for opportunities to work with other charities that really aim at younger children it's it's proven that our biases um, are formed between the age of 5 and 7 and those unconscious biases can really impact us for the rest of our, our lives. So I'm currently looking for an opportunity to work with children of that age to show that women can be leaders um, in any industry, but obviously clearly promoting the golf industry while I'm at it. And what's your hope for that? Where, where would you like to get to with that? I would just like to see change. I, I would like to see the needle moved with more women in leadership across the world, more directors on boards, more CEOs that are women. Um, but we've got to start somewhere. And during the um, a lot of the talks that I do, I talk about a three-phase process, which is evolve, recruit, and retain. You know, the evolve is really that five to seven-year-old, you know, changing those biases and working with educational institutes to make sure that we teach young children that they can be anything they want, whether that be boys being nurses, which is a very female in industry, or whether it be women, girls being greenkeepers, which is obviously a male industry at the moment, very dominated by men. So I think you know that evolve stage is really important because otherwise we're always going to be fighting the same fight. We've got to start changing this at a much younger age. The recruit is obviously about the here and the now. So what do we do about the here and the now? And you know, could you relook at the way that you recruit? Um, you know, could you task your HR department with providing you with a more diverse range of CVs and then removing the names off them? So that unconscious bias that we have at a young age is then not impacting who we choose for that job. Um, and then obviously there is the uh, retain. You know, are we, do we have a, um, an all-inclusive work environment. When I first started working for Jacobson, I worked in the sales team, and many of the greenkeeping facilities I went to didn't have female toilets. You know, so I hope that's changed now. But you know, that's part of being an inclusive uh, environment to work in. And when people see any biases, really standing up. So it's not. It's as I said before. It's, it's not a one. One element will change this, you know, it's multifaceted. So looking at lots of different approaches. So there's some guidance there for uh, businesses. Mm. But what would your message be for any young woman watching this? Maybe a child, maybe a, maybe a young woman who's already um, in the industry, perhaps outside the industry, but considering stuff. What would, you, what would your message be? And what are the practical steps that they can take? Yeah, I would say um, educate yourself um, or, you know, Keep learning, regardless of what that looks like. And I, I mentioned I left school at 16, but I went back and did a degree at 30. So it can look at like whatever you want it to be. Um, but keep keep progressing. Um, 
challenge yourself every step of the way, make goals for yourself um, so you're not stagnant. But most of all, just have fun. You know, it, it's a, we all talk about career and it becomes this very serious subject, you know, but it's about having fun. We spend a lot of time doing this. So, you know, have fun, make sure you work with good people and, uh, and enjoy it. Karen Proctor, thank you very much for speaking to Growing Golf. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'd love to know your thoughts, so please do comment, ask a question, or rate the episode. You'll find more stories, insights, and case studies on SyngentaGolf.com. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.